Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Come on and stand to your feet with us this morning. Come on, who's ready to worship today? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's just begin to invite God's presence into this room. God, we know that you're here, Lord, so we just welcome your presence in this place. God, we just want to start this time of worship, God, by just acknowledging you, Lord. God, acknowledging your presence. God, we ask that as we're about to sing, Lord, that you would just come and rest on us, Father. God, we love you so much. We thank you for your goodness. God, for who you are. We love you, Father. Thank you, Lord. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Rest on us, come rest on us, come down, spirit when you move you make my heart pound, when you fill the room, you're here.
Without you, these would just be songs, Father. Empty songs, and this whole time would just be pointless, God. But we thank you that you show up and you fill these songs with your presence, with your anointing. God, that you go forth, Father. God, we praise you in this place. You are so worthy. No 
Just take a second. God, just declare how good you are. 
God, we just declare how faithful you are. God, you are welcome in this place. God, we love you. part but I love this song we heard this we were at a conference recently and I love that it says a sound mind for the spirit of fear because how many of you know that that tells us and and God's word actually says that right that we're not given a spirit of fear but of power love and a sound mind this is straight from the word of God and so that's why I love to sing it because it's just singing his word over our lives but I love that it says a sound mind for the spirit of fear because that tells us even in the Bible that fear is a spirit, right? And the, in the name of Jesus, it has to flee, right? So we can speak to that spirit of fear. And I want you to even do that right now and say, spirit of fear, you have to go. Not if you want to, not maybe next week, not maybe next year, not maybe after a few more services. Right now, the spirit of fear has to leave. Right now, come on, get excited if you believe that. If you speak that over your own life, And we're about to sing praise to him, praise to God for giving us this authority. We're going to say, you saved, healed, delivered me. Jesus' blood washed over me. Command my soul, awake, arise. Come on, use each breath to prophesy. I prophesy. That's what we're going to sing. And so these are more than just empty words. These are more than just something that we sing and then we forget about this afternoon. But I want you to sing this like this as your life source because it is. He is. Come on, do you believe that? These words is our life source. That we prophesy this over ourselves right now. That we are saved because of who he is. Thank you, Lord. God, we just praise you for that in this place. Praise you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're so good. Help me sing. You saved, healed, delivered me, 
Jesus' blood wash over me. Come on. Command my soul to wake your eyes. Use each breath to prophesy. I prophesy. Sing it again. You say, heal, deliver me. Jesus' blood wash over me. Command my soul to wake your eyes. Use each breath to prophesy. I prophesy. Sing it out. You say, heal. into his presence like we do each Sunday. It's such a special privilege and I want to thank you for joining in with us. If you'll be seated right now, we want to do a little special thing. You know, go ahead. So as we were preparing for the service today, it was just heavy on our hearts this morning that there's many of us, including myself, that deal with making sure that we have a sound mind. And I'm looking across, I'm, I'm looking at the worship team, I'm looking at you guys, I'm looking at teachers, I'm looking at retired I'm looking at everybody in here this morning, and it's my heart that as we look into your eyes and into your life, that we're speaking life into you. Now, I'm, I'm talking to people in here. I'm dealing with it, so I know you are. There is an overwhelming presence that is just fighting us in this world today. There's an undercurrent of evil that is trying to steal and to kill and destroy. And as we start this year, it's just our heart this morning to pray into you, to speak into you, to prophesy over you. We want to just stand alongside of you. We want to help you battle. We want to help you fight. We want to help you guys stand strong and be firm in the Word of God. So Steve and I are going to pray over you. If we feel led, we'll call on somebody. We'll, we'll come out and speak over you if we feel like it. You know, we're just trying to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit this morning. We are talking to every person in here. You might think you've got it all together, but I'm telling you, about the time you think you stand, that's when you fall. That's right. And the powers of darkness are doing everything they can to cause your sound mind to waver. I don't care who you are. I don't care, I don't care how strong you think you are. Mm -hmm. He's always attacking, lurking, and he wants to cause things to happen that will make you fail and not be successful. Mm -hmm. All right. And you know that this is a, a special time of the year. It happens about this time every year. What happens? School starts back, and the teachers have already been back in school for about a week already. Many have been several weeks getting ready for this year. And uh, we want to take a little special time. They're doing this over in Children's Church right now also. We want, if you're a, a teacher, staff, uh, administrator, support staff, in any way you're associated with the school vocationally, we want you to stand right there where you are. And we're going to just pray over you as our church family. We want to thank you guys for your time and for the service that you give to people. 
I know our schools are under attack, not just, not just physical attack, they're under spiritual attack. The enemy's trying to invade our schools and bring all kinds of doctrines and teachings that are totally contrary to Scripture. So we're thankful for Christian leaders in our schools who have the privilege not only to stand there and to teach, but also the privilege and opportunity to stand and say, we will not let this happen in our place. We will stand against what the ungodly are trying to bring in. Be bold and be strong. Let me encourage you to do that. Speak out for your faith. Stand up for what's right. And uh, if, uh, if the devil comes against you, you know you've got a lot of people supporting you. And uh, they're with you to pray over you. So I'm going to ask if you're, sta- if you're sitting by someone uh, who's standing right now, one of our uh, staff, teachers, and so forth, if you'd just stretch your hands out right there toward them, we're going to pray over them right now. Just lift them up, stretch them out there. Father, we want to thank you so much, God, for these who are involved in our school system. We know that the school system is what trains up our children. We know that our schools are under a tremendous attack, an attack to take away the decency of humanity, take away the the, uh, genius of creation that you made. We know our schools are under attack to bring about the false teachings of other religions. We pray right now that as one nation under one God, we will stand with our teachers in our cities. We pray all across our nation, but specifically we also pray right here, right now for these teachers, for these schools. We know we've already walked the halls of our local schools and prayed over them. The pastors and associate pastors around the area have prayed, and we just declare right now peace. It's a peace zone, a safety zone, a zone where your your spirit is present and free to move regardless of what the law may say, God, we thank you that you supersede all men's laws and your presence is goes where it desires. And we release your presence in these schools, in DeKalb, in Hubbard, in Malta, in Avery, and all around our surrounding area, Lord. We just pray over these schools and over these teachers. We thank you in advance that you're going to do great and mighty things, that you will do uh, a great calling in our lives, and we, you're calling America back to you again, God. We want to see revival break out in the schools in the cities and all across our land. We just want to thank you in advance for the hedge of protection that's around our administrators, staff, and teachers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now pay attention to the screen for today's announcements. Good morning and welcome to Maranatha Christian Center. If this is your first time, we are so excited that you've joined us today. And a big shout out to those joining us through our live stream. We're about to hear an exciting message from our pastor, but before we do, check out this week's announcements. We took a short summer break from our midweek services, but this Wednesday night, August 10th, we will ramp up again and all join together to relaunch with Family Night. We're going to have a watermelon bash, and it's going to be so much fun. So bring a lawn chair, bring a friend, and we'll see you August 10th at 6.30 for Family Night. Then, starting back on August 17th, get plugged into one of our midweek classes. There are small groups for all ages. We have Bible study, next-gen young adults, our middle school and high school student ministries, and classes for kids. For more info on any of our Wednesday night services, check out our website, maranathadecab.org. That's it for today's announcements. If you'd like to know more about anything you've heard today, you can visit our website or email info at maranathadecab.org. You can also follow us on social media or opt in to get text updates on your mobile device. If you'd like to give your tithes and offerings, we have giving boxes at the front and the back of the room, as well as an iPad station if you'd like to give online. Okay, now take a minute to say hi to someone next to you, and if you have kids ages birth through eighth grade, you can now take them to their kids' classes. Just head through the double doors to your left, and we'll be back in a few minutes with an exciting message from our pastor. All right. Well, it's good to be with you again this morning. I'm excited about what God's going to speak to us. I want to share a couple of things with you this morning. I know that great things are are on the way. I want to share my word for the day with you. Uh, This is kind of a a unique thing. Uh, You know, you do your daily Bible readings, and this morning I was reading the Scripture, and uh, a certain verse came to me uh, in in my devotion, and it was the verse there. And then, so we got to church here this morning, and I kept noticing a piece of paper laying over there on the floor back in front of the sound booth. And I didn't go pick it up. I kind of forgot. And I just came back in. It was still over there. I went over and picked it up. It was the exact same verse that was uh, my Bible verse this morning. And I'm going to share that with you because it's a good word. It's in Isaiah 41. It says, Fear not, 
for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. That's a good word. So why don't you claim that for you today? Fear not, he says, I am with you. Fear not, because I will be there with you. I'll not let you be dismayed. I'll not let you be destroyed. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. So we're excited about that. Thank you for receiving that word this morning. You know, as I look back across my life and look at the lives of the many people we've come in contact with, I understand that every day, every day that comes is another day that we can live for God's purpose. We can live according to God's plan and in obedience to his desires. He gives us that opportunity, but you know, the question comes up sometimes, how can we be certain that we're walking in his will? Especially when we go through times of difficulty. We go through times of trials. Things didn't work out like we thought they were going to. Maybe do we back up and look and say, wait a minute, hey, did I get out of God's will? How, why, why am I having difficult situations? Why am I having a hard time? I thought if I was in God's will, like everybody would just lay down in front of me. I just walk through like going down a runway, you know, and waving at everybody. Oh, I'm right in the middle of God's will. Everything's right, pushing up, you know, daisies. Everything's just going good. But sometimes we have struggles, don't we? I know you can relate to that because I know you. We, we see you. We hear you. We're with you. We know you have struggles. And just being in God's will doesn't mean you're not going to have struggles. Oftentimes in God's will, we face obstacles that we may not would have faced out of God's will. And some say, well, I don't want to get in God's will then. Let me tell you, it's much better to face them in God's will than just face them out of God's will. <laughs> You're going to have those things. Jesus said, and we use this very often, one of my life verses seems like lately. He said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. That means you're going to have struggles. In this world, you're going to have some struggle. He said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I will uphold you with my righteous hand, he says. So just because you hit an obstacle, yeah, it's okay to back up and say, God, did I miss something? But then get that confirmation when you're in God's will. We had that happen to us and have it happen to us all the time. We had to back up and say, God, are we missing something here? And if he says, no, you're right, we want you to be, then what do you do? You put your head down and you plow ahead. You say, nothing's going to hinder God's will in my life. I can go through, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So each day that we live, and today you've already experienced this, you have decisions you have to make. You had to decide what you were going to put on. Well, that wasn't that big of a decision, was it? You know, well, I don't know, maybe for some it was. Uh, you have to decide, you know, for, first of all, am I going to go to church this morning? Thank you guys for making that decision. We appreciate that. And then, you know, but you have to decide certain things. Some decisions aren't very important, but some things are very, very important. And we need to be able to know that when we're making very important decisions, that we have a helper, we have a Holy Spirit. And Jesus said he will lead you, he'll guide you, he'll lead you into truth. He'll lead you in the way which you should go. So the decisions that we have to make, we can make according to God's purpose and God's plan according to God's will. Today I'm going to share with you uh, uh, some principles that will help you in this. One, to evaluate our circumstances and then make decisions through the lens of God's will. Not based on the lens of the world, not based on the lens of public opinion, but based looking through the lens of God's will for your life. God assures us that whatever we experience, even in our difficulties, you know that, he has redeemed us and he can make these things work for our ultimate good. We can know his will. We can thank him for his empowering presence and unwavering love in these things. So we're going to talk about this. And before we get into that, I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to read a verse to you. Now, that was just kind of the, the introduction. Romans chapter 12, a very familiar verse. While you're turning there, I want to share a little story with you. A pastor came into a new town, first week in town, came to the church there in town, and he was walking down the street, walked to the post office, and he got down in the, in the middle of the town there. He got kind of confused, didn't know exactly where he was going. He, he knew the post office in the general vicinity, and a little boy came by on a bicycle. He said, hey, son, can, can you help me a minute? He said, sure, what do you need? He said, well, I'm the new preacher here in town. And he said, uh, can you tell me how to get to the post office? And the little boy said, sure. Go right down here, turn right, then turn back left. That's where the post office will be. So the pastor wanted to make an impression, invite the young boy, and, you know, do a little outreach while he's there. He said, hey, if you'll come over to our church tonight, I'll show you how to get to heaven. The little boy looked at him and said, how can you show me how to get to heaven? You don't even know where the post office is. <laughs> Sometimes the wisdom of kids so today we're talking about, I started just call it God's will. Then I said, God's will, can I know it? And then last you say, God's will, how can I know it? 
It's not just enough to know that God has a will. How can I know God's will? How can I? Can I know? Do you believe you can know God's will in your life? Do you believe God has a will for your life? You know, these, these things we have to answer for ourselves because if you don't believe God has a will for your life, then you're not going to be looking for that. And he may be trying to give you direction, give you guidance, and show you what he wants to do. But if you're not looking for it, you're not expecting it, then you may miss it. So we're going to read some scripture and talk about some scripture. Romans chapter 12, very, very familiar verse. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, you know how it goes, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then he goes, and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I've got a couple of supporting passages. I want to read along with that. They're not, uh, you didn't tell you to turn to them, but I'm going to read them to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We're very familiar with that verse. It says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Those who are the called. If you've been born again, you've been called according to his purpose. Did you know that every human being that is born has a calling on their life? God has a plan and a will for every human being. No matter, not just here in the United States, all over the world, he has a plan. You think, how can God do that? Because he's God. And he has a plan. Every one of us have a calling on our lives. Many never walk in that calling. Many never see that calling. Many never, you know, God's will is that, that we walk in his plan, his calling. But some never do that. Then Philippians chapter 1 says this, being confident. I like that word confident. And I have to use it a lot. I say, I am confident that God is in this, that God, of this very thing, that God who began a good work and we will perform that work and will perfect that work and complete that work till the day of Jesus Christ. There's another saying you can say along with that, please be patient with me. God isn't finished with me yet. See, God's working in our lives. He's working in our lives to do one major thing, that is to conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Then Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God works in us to want to do his will and then to give us the ability to do that will. So I want you to take those verses and, and keep those verses, maybe go back through them again from time to time, and just remember that they are given to us to help us Know that God has a will for our lives and to help us seek and find that will for our lives. Two things that I want to note from Romans chapter 12. If you read that verse, it says this, two things. One, surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the expected life. That's expected of us. As believers, we're expected to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Jesus told his disciples, follow me. In other words, do what I say. And then one place he told them, he said, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? It's expected that he be the Lord of our lives. And by the way, Lord is just a word for boss. If you like boss, better say that. He wants to be the boss of our lives. He's not only our overseer, he's our caretaker. And he wants to be the boss of our lives so he can take care of us the way he wants to. So surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the expected life. Also, knowing God's will for your life is the accepted life. That's the life that is most acceptable to you. God's will for your life, you've heard me say this before, fits you perfectly. Now I want to ask a question this morning. If someone asks you what Christians mean when they speak of the will of God in their life, what would you say? If someone asks you on the street or at work or where you might be, well, you guys talk about God's will in your life. What are you talking about? You know, God's will is a very wide, that, that range, that it's a, it's a very open area. And there's a lot of different things that we can ask. We are not need to answer back, what specifically are you talking about? Because when we say God's will, we just throw it out there and say, you know, just in general, God's will. But there are different kinds. So although it may seem a strange concept to the unsaved, but believers need to understand exactly what it means when we talk about God's will. The will of God refers to his purpose, his plan, and his provision for our lives. His purpose, his plan, his provision. And by the way, contrary to what some people might teach, there's not three levels to God's will. Some take that Romans chapter 12 and say, we know there's three levels to God's will. It says that you might prove what is the acceptable, or the, the, accept, the good will of God. The good first. Oh, okay, well, I, I, I think this is okay. This is good. That's God's good will for me. 
But uh, I'm not really it. But the next level will be the acceptable. Well, this is acceptable. And the third level will be the perfect will of God. So, yeah, that's what we strive for. You know, we may live in the good for a while, then move on up to the acceptable, but we're really striving for the perfect will of God. You see, there's not three levels of God's will. God's will is all at the same time, all at once, both good or all three, good, acceptable, and perfect. God's will is good. God's will is acceptable. God's will is perfect. So don't be one of those who says, well, you know, I know I'm not God's perfect will, but at least I'm in his acceptable will. That's not what he's looking for. He's looking for us to be in his will, and in his will it's good, acceptable, and perfect. God's will is all at the same time, those things. Another scripture I want to share with you out of Psalm chapter 40, just a simple little verse. It says, I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is in my heart. I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is in my heart. Do you delight in God's will? What does it mean to delight in something? Well, you all know some things I delight in. I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> Don't have to say it. But you, I delight, we, delight, we delight in companionship. We delight in friendship. We delight in vacations. We de but do you delight in? In doing God's will. Have you ever thought about that? I delight to be in your will. I delight to be in your word. I delight to hear your, your will and your law is in my heart. And though the Bible says that, yet people sit in churches every week, week after week after week, and never even consider God's will for their lives. All they consider is looking at what I see and deciding on what I see, what I want, and going after what I want. Never, ever considering, God, what is your will for my life? Maybe you're in a place right now and you feel like I'm working hard, I'm doing all the right things, but I just don't seem to be fulfilled. You see, God's will comes with self-fulfillment. doesn't matter what you accomplish, how much you do outside of God's will, there's a part of your life that is designed to be built around God's will. Have you ever just sat down in a quiet time and said, God, is there, do you have a will for my life? I believe you do. What is that? And would you be so bold and so trusting and so filled with faith as to say, God, I don't know what your will is exactly, but whatever it is, I'm going to tell you right now, that's what I want. I want your will to be done in my life as the, you taught us to pray, Jesus, your kingdom come, your will be done in this life right now. I pray your will be done. Would you be willing to pray that and ask God, God, your will be done. Maybe you're having a little bit of, of discouragement where you are. I, I like to call this, maybe you're, you've been settled in, everything's been going smooth, but you're kind of in a nest and everything's going smooth and you feel the, the nest being ruffled a little bit. You think, I don't know what's going on, but something's changing. Maybe God's designed to move you further into his will. Maybe you moved into his will. It was a perfect will at that time, but now God, you know, God's will is often a progressive will. He takes us from place to place to place, step to step to step, and we get in one place, and we tend to want to camp in that place. We want to stay in that place because we get comfortable in that place, and we don't say, I don't really want to move anywhere. God, I've made it myself comfortable in this place. But God wants to stretch us, our faith, and cause to live by faith and not by sight. He says, this is just the a step along the way. It is my will. It was my perfect will at that time, but now it's changed. It's time to move on because God's will is a perfect will. It moves and it changes. So people sit in churches week after week and never think about God's will. They have no idea what he wants in their lives, what they were created for. Because see, God didn't create us just to exist. He created us to, to, to do something. And so if we're not in that, then we don't have any idea of what we were created for. We're just going through the motions of life. We're just living, trying to get through the day, through the week, through the month, get to our next vacation. God's will for our life is something that's exciting. Every day in our lives, we should be living for God's purpose, according to God's plan, and in obedience to his desire. So how can we be sure? Well, one way we can be sure is let the Holy Spirit tell us. He'll let you know. Jesus said he'll lead you. He'll let you know. How can you be sure, though, you're walking God's will, especially in times of difficulty? Although trials may seem contrary to God's will, he has promised us that 
whatever comes our li- in our lives, he has designed for our will and will work for our good. I don't understand how that happened, but he says in Romans chapter 8 that we read, all we know that all things work together for good to those who love. He can cause all things to work together for good. He didn't say everything was good. He said he can cause it and make it good. In fact, like Joseph told his brothers, as for you, you meant it for evil when you sold me into bondage and slavery, but God meant it for good. God can take the greatest evil and turn it into something that works to your greatest good. So always be willing to trust God and say, God, I don't know what's going on, but I know you're working it for good in my life. Confusion comes in our lives when we don't understand what is meant by God's will. So the first question that we need to ask then, do you believe that everything that God wills is going to happen? Now don't answer that out loud because it's a trick question. <laughs> I'll let you know ahead of time. It's a trick question. If you say, do you believe everything God's will is going to happen? Oh, yes, I believe that. Well, it doesn't. Everything that God wills doesn't happen. You said, well, what do you mean it doesn't happen? God created man. It was not his will that man fall, but he gave man intellect and volition. It meant he gave us the ability to choose. It wasn't God's will that Adam and Eve disobey and eat of the wrong tree. But God gave them the ability to choose, and you've got the ability to choose. Just because you choose something doesn't mean it's God's will. You can choose to do the wrong thing. So everything that God wills does not happen. You say, show me in the scripture. Okay, I will. Just hang on. The choice to disobey and go against God's perfect will was given to mankind. We can choose to go against his will. For example, if we ask, what is God's will? See, First of all, God has a general will. That's his will for everything, a general will. Let me give you some examples of God's general will. It's true for all people. I can tell you what God's general will is for, for mankind. General will. Here it is in Scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says this. This is good acceptable in the, in the sight of God our Savior. It's good acceptable in God our Savior who desires for all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It's God's will that all be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Do you believe that? No, the Bible says it. This is God's will. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. God's will, good and acceptable. And here it is, that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. But not everybody is. Why? Because God's given us a choice. And some choose not to get in on God's will. So if that, that says to me if someone wants to be born again, they can be. Because it's God's will that all be saved, come to the knowledge of truth. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will. So that's God's general will. We know that. We know the Bible says now that God's will is that all men dwell in peace. Are they doing that? No. Even all, not all churches are even dwelling in peace. There are churches that are divided, greatly divided. It's not God's will that we walk outside of that fellowship and peace, but people do it. So that's God's general will. But then there's God's specific will. His specific will must be revealed by him to us. Specific things like, I don't know what color car you're supposed to buy. I don't know if you're supposed to buy that car. Maybe you're looking at a house and, and you're thinking, uh, I, I don't know. Tell me if I'm supposed to. I don't know God's specific will unless he reveals it to me. God's specific will is something he speaks specifically to you. He takes the written word of God and gives you a spoken word of God, a rhema. And he says, this is for you. It happens all the time. It's simple. You know, you say, how would you know? I just know that God said it's, it's, it's right. Oftentimes, people get in trouble because they go around looking for somebody to give them God's specific will for them. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm just going to see if somebody will tell me. So they go and somebody tells them what to do. And I've seen it happen so many times. It's not the right thing. God is not obligated to give someone else his will for your life. Oftentimes he will confirm things through other people. We've had that happen so many times in our lives. But don't go around seeking signs of God's will by saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Maybe God will tell you what I'm supposed to do. You are responsible for hearing what God wants. His specific will is specific to you, and he speaks it to you. 
Let me give you some examples of God's specific will. Noah, build an ark. What's an ark? <laughs> that was specific. He didn't give it to everybody else. Noah, build an ark. And everybody else thought Noah was crazy. First of all, it never had rain. What do you mean going, water's going to come up over these mountains? It's not going to happen. Noah, build an ark. Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. But God's specific will led him to Nineveh for a specific purpose. He told Philip, go join yourself with this eunuch on the road out there. That's God's specific will. These are instances. He told Peter, Peter, you go preach to the Gentiles. Biblical instances of God speaking specific will. Has he spoken a specific will in your life and you haven't done it yet? Well, I'm waiting for something else. I don't want to do that. I want choice number two. You know, God's not obligated to give us choice number two till we obey choice number one. God's will is not a smorgasbord. You'll pick and choose what you want out of it. And remember this, his will is perfect and acceptable and good. It's good for you. Well, I'm afraid if, I, how many times have we heard this? I'm afraid if I really surrender to God, he'll go make me go to some unknown tribe and preach. Oh, he's not going to do that. There's a scripture that says if we put our trust and faith in God, he will give us the desires of our heart. When God called us into ministry, he didn't call us into ministry against our will. He called us into ministry fulfilling our will. We desired to do that. He said, I'm going to let you do it. I'm going to let you do it. Now, when I was growing up, it wasn't my desire to do that. But as I grew and matured, God put it in, and I surrendered my life to Christ. It became my desire to minister to be a part of what he's doing. Confusion comes when we don't understand that God has a specific will. And there are different categories of God's will. Different categories. Let me share some categories. We talked about this already. The predetermined will of God. God has already said this is going to happen. And we're living in time and we're moving toward a predetermined event. We don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. Russia, China, United States, nobody's going to be able to vote against it and stop it. It's going to happen. We're moving toward the time when Jesus Christ is going to stand up, the trumpet's going to sound, the angel's going to blast out a shout, and the dead in Christ are going to rise. There is an end coming, and no man can stop it. No man can hurry it up. No man can hold it off. That's God's predetermined will. No amount of prayer can stop that. Jesus Christ was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Hell couldn't stop it, though they tried. The demons tried to stop Jesus being crucified. They did everything they could do trying to get rid of Jesus Christ. They actually thought they had it won when they killed him. They tried to push him off a cliff. That didn't work. They tried to get the crowd to do it. That didn't work. So they said, well, nail him to a cross. And God said, okay, go ahead. That's my, that's my specific will. <laughs> do you know the Bible says this? That even the prince of this ages, that's the demons, they didn't know what God's plan was. If they had of, they would never have crucified Jesus. Because when they crucified Jesus, they sealed the doom. They made man's kind, mankind uh, open for salvation. The temple was open. The holy holies was open. And the demons did it themselves. Had him crucified thinking they won. But after three days they said, uh-oh, I think we messed up. That's the predetermined will of God. There is a moral will of God. And these are righteous standards by which God intends mankind to live. A good example is he gave us the Ten Commandments. And you know, even lost people have in them, sometimes they squelch it, but there is in us the ability to know right from wrong. There's that moral will. People in other countries know it's not right to murder, though they do it sometimes because of their evil influence. They know it's not right to steal. There are laws all across the world even. Some places, if you steal something, no matter how insignificant, you get your hand cut off. So there's a moral will. Here in America, we're doing our very best to squelch that moral will and do away with that moral will, but it's still there. There is a desired will of God. God desires and specifies how he wants us to live as Christians. He has a desire for your life. 
There is a circumstantial will of God. We fail to live up to God's standards. He knows. He wants us to know that we should respond in these circumstances. The circumstantial will of God comes when we get out of God's will and certain things happen. Have you ever been out of God's will? Uh, you know, like, like for, let me give you a real simple example. Jonah. God told Jonah to do what? Go to where? Go to Nineveh and do what? Preach. What did Jonah do? He got out of that will. He said, I'm going to Joppa. He went to Joppa and he got on a boat and was running from God's will. Circumstances prevailed. And in the midst of those circumstances, he woke up and said, what in the world am I doing in this mess? You know, just the fact that he woke up inside the belly of that great fish let him know, hey, God must not be through with me. I'm still alive. And so he got out of his circumstances he wasn't under the circumstances. He was in the circumstances. He got out of his circumstance, and what did he do? He got back in the will of God. Maybe you're out of God's will, and you're in that circumstantial will where God's allowed things to come to try to turn you back. See, God loves you so much, he'd not let you go wandering off in rebellion. He'll put obstacles along the way to turn you, to try to get you to come back. Circumstantial will of God, and then there's the immediate will of God. So, the immediate will of God covers what the Lord wants to do to us today, right now in the situation we're in. God, what is your will for me today? I need to know. I need to know what it is right now. So you see now why the confusion is. Somebody said, what do you Christians mean by the will of God? Well, there's a lot of different categories in the will of God, but basically overall it is the rule of God in the lives of a believer. There's many ways he does that. How can we be sure that what we're considering is the will of God? Oh, man, that's a tricky one. How can we be sure it's the will of God? Well, each day we have decisions. They fill our minds and we think, I don't know what I'm supposed to do about this. I don't know what to do about this. And there's certain things we know for sure, but some decisions that we have to make may be practical decisions. They may be moral, financial, or, you know, do we, need, do we buy this house? Do we buy this house? Do I take this job or I don't take this job? It looks so good if I take this job. How many times have you had two very important Opportunities, And as you start looking at those, what I should do, you start thinking, I don't know what's the right thing to do. So you go to this part of it and you start weighing out. And now if I take this, okay, it's going to be a lot more money. It's going to be, this, but we're going to have to move over here. We're going to move away from our church, but I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe God's going to move us away from our church. Maybe, uh, you know, a lot of people move toward the money rather than toward the word of God. We tell people all the time, do not, do not ever make decisions about where you attend church based on finances. If, if we've had people move from this town to another town because they had a better job. So did God tell you to take that? If God didn't tell you, don't go. You stay, you, you be sure. If you do, if God does lead you, you find where he wants you to go to church before you get there. And you pray about it. How many times has God done that in our lives? Something, something come up and we say, is this the right thing to do? And so you weigh out everything. That, yeah, 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 that, that's right. But on the other hand, then there's this negative. But if I do this, now I've got this positive. So we find ourselves in a quandary going back and forth deciding will the positive outweigh the negative? Which one's the best? It doesn't really matter. There's only one question you should ask in a situation like that. God, what do you want me to do? And then just shut your mouth and listen. Don't try to figure it out. Oh, I've done that so many times. The reason I'm saying that to you is because I've done, I had to say that to me. I've prayed about things and I've thought about it. And then as soon as I get through praying, God, what do you want me to do? Then I start trying. Now, if I do this, this happens. If I do this, that happens. Get right back in the same thing, trying to figure out. The Bible says walk in the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you. You say, well, and sometimes, you know, I just have to say, I, right now I refuse to hear any voice but the Lord Jesus Christ. I confess that the Bible says, my sheep hear my voice, and the voice of the stranger they will not follow. So I'm not going to hear your voice, Satan. You shut up. I'm going to hear what Jesus says. And I can assure you, if you spend the time, you'll hear what Jesus says. You'll know. If you desire, if you really desire to know truth, the Bible says you'll know that truth, and that truth will set you free. So first of all, there are certain things that we need to know when we're considering God's will for our lives. He already knows every circumstance. He already knows where it's going to lead us. He knows what's going to be there when we get there. So many times when God says no to you, it, you better thank him for saying no. 
because he's blocking something that would be harmful, be destructive, be detrimental to your family, to you. God's not saying no because he can. He's saying no because it's the right thing. It's the best for you. I love the scripture that says God says he has, he has our best interest at heart. He wants what's best for us. He knows every circumstance from birth to death. And he has the wisdom, the grace, the goodness, and the mercy to work in our hearts and guide every aspect of our lives if we'll just give it to him. Someone said one time, I really, it really made an impact on my life. He said, God reserves his very, very best for those who leave the decision up to him. He knows what's best for you. He wants what's best for you. Are you willing to allow him to give you that best? For us to be able to confirm whether what we're thinking about, the decision we make, align with God's will, there's some questions we need to ask ourselves. We need to ask ourselves some questions. I got... We can go through this real quickly, so you might want to jot them down. Ten questions we should ask when considering something that, that's facing, a decision we're making. Ten questions we should ask. Number one, is this decision consistent with God's word? That's simple. If it's not consistent with God's word, it's not to be. That's cut and dried, Right? If it goes against God's word, it's not going to, he's never going to lead you to go against his word. His will, his word always agree. Second question, is it a wise choice? You think, now I mean, you can justify this one if you want to sometime, but when I say a wise choice, let me ask this. Would, would the world be better if everyone did this? You know, is it wise? The initial consideration should be what are the consequences of it? The third one, can I honestly ask God to enable me to achieve this decision? Can I ask God to enable me to achieve this? Oh, I don't know if I can. It's, a little bit, it's kind of a little bit under the table. I don't know if I can ask God to do this or not. If you have to set aside some of your scruples and say, well, God, just don't look at this. I, it's not really all that above board, but still, it's going to be really good in the long run. If you can't ask God to help you do it, then you shouldn't do it. I have a saying, if it's doubtful, it's dirty. If it's doubtful, it's dirty. Don't do it. Is it a wise choice? Can I honestly ask God to enable me? Can you ask God to bless it? Do I have genuine peace about this decision? Not am I... Call, and, you know, oftentimes I don't really have peace about something, but I come up with a peace. I can kind of overcome the l little lack of peace by looking at the advantages. No, no, I don't mean do you have to overcome obstacles to have peace. I mean, do you have peace that it's the right thing? The Bible says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The word rule there is like the word for umpire. Let it be the one that calls the balls and the strikes. If he says it's a ball, it's a ball. He says if it's a strike, then strike. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Do I have genuine peace about this? Is this consistent with the way God works? Think about it. God has a certain consistency about the things he does. Is this consistent or would you say, no, this is cutting corners? I've got to, I've got to, I'm going to have to cut a couple of corners for this to work. It's not if everybody knew all the things going on, it wouldn't really, might not really glorify God, so it's not really consistent with how he works. Again, can I ask God to bless this? Does this de decision fit who I am as a follower of Christ? Does it fit who I am? Will people be better off if I do this? You know, we can just, oh yeah, my family's gonna be better off. I, uh, but, Think about it, if people if it's not going to be consistent. Here's something that I was trying to make a decision one time. It really, really was a, it wasn't a big thing to anybody else, but it was to me. I wasn't even married at the time, but God spoke to me about something, and and here's what came to me: Will it dull the keen edge of your testimony? If it's doubtful, it's dirty. Will it dull the keen edge if somebody sees that and says, "Oh." I wouldn't have thought they would do it. I thought they were a Christian. You don't have to, God's perfect will, you don't have to justify and, say, and let people aren't going to have to say, oh, I thought they were a Christian. 
They'll say, oh, look, they're a Christian. This is something God's led them to do. Will it dull the keen edge of your testimony? Ask this question. Does the idea fit God's overall plan for my life? That's assuming you know God's overall plan for your life. And I can tell you what God's overall plan for your life is that you, through your body, through your life, bring glory to Jesus Christ. That's his overall plan. He wants you to establish you to be a reflection of the glory of Jesus Christ to this world. He wants you to bring people to, to him. He wants you to be an example of a believer. Does that help do that? If it doesn't help do that, then you better back away from it. And this is along the same line. Does this decision honor God? Here's something you can ask. Would I be one to do this when Jesus came back? I remember one time, this was a long time ago, I was sitting in a show I shouldn't have been in. <laughs> and, you know, there was a bunch of bad language, a bunch of bad stuff in it. I was thinking, oh, I hope Jesus don't come back and catch me sitting in this show. <laughs> I mean, he already knew, but, you know, I'd hate to be embarrassed on the way up, you know. I want to be excited to see him come out. I want to be, you know. Does it honor God? Will this choice result in unrest and regret for the rest of my life? If I make this choice, am I going to have to hide it for the rest of my life? That's not God's will. He doesn't want you to have to live a life hiding things. And 10, can I expect God to reward me for this decision? Is there something that God will be blessed by? Will he reward me for making that decision? Now, I don't know where you fit in all these things. I don't know how, what part they play in you, but all of us have decisions to make, don't we? And these things, yes, we can know God's will. But there are certain things that we have to ask. First of all, am I willing to be obedient to God's will? I want you to bow your heads with me. I'm not going to have anybody stand, but I, I do want to pray with, with some of you. Uh, I, I feel there are quite a few people here that are making some decisions. And I think beyond any, I feel in my spirit this morning that you want what God wants. And you genuinely want that, but you genuinely don't know. You know, you can genuinely desire and genuinely be confused about what God is saying. But God wants to speak clearly to you about it. We've seen it happen over and over in our lives and lives of other people. You're watching online today. Maybe you're there and you say, I know God's, want, God's up to something, but I don't know what it is, but I just want to know what God wants. And whatever that is, that's what I want to do. So if you're, maybe you're, as a couple, you'll make, do this. If you're deciding, and make, you're in a place right now where you need to make a decision about something, it may be insignificant to everybody but you, but it may be world-shaking. World, it may change the way you're going in life. Whatever it might be, however small it is to, to you or however insignificant, however great it might be, let me tell you this. If it in, if it's interests you, it interests God. He cares. He desires. He wants to know also. He wants to be involved in it. So if you do, if that's, I want you just to lift your hands. Let me just pray over you. Several, there's one, two, three. Come on, more and more, making decisions, things that God, you know, something that you're, you're thinking about. As I was talking, you thought about, i got to make a decision about this, okay? Just hold your hands up there. I'm going to pray over you. Father, I just lift up these right now that are holding their hands up, those that may be holding their hands up right there watching online. I thank you, God, that you are not into confusion. You didn't give us a spirit of confusion, that you desire that we know truth from the inward parts, and I just release that truth right now. I pray that the word that you speak will go forth into these hearts, these lives, that will know for certain that it's you. Because when we know for certain it's you, God, we have an absolute bulldozer effect. We just hang on and we go regardless of what circumstances may view. We can go with confidence and boldness. And I pray that that confidence and boldness would rise up in these right now that are raising their hands, that are asking for your direction. They want your will and, you, and they're believing for your will and they're desiring that will. And we want to thank you for that, Father, and give you the glory and praise in Jesus' name for that. Amen. Now, if everyone would stand. We're going to stand and be dismissed in just a moment. If you're here this morning and you've never received Christ as your Savior, we'll give you that opportunity. He said that he desires, remember, that all be saved come to the knowledge of the truth. So if you'd like to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, as I said at the beginning, I really can't show you how to go to heaven. 
I mean, I can find the post office, but I can tell you how to get to heaven because the Bible tells me it's how. It's a simple thing. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess that you're a sinner. Ask him to come into your life and uh, forgive your sin. He said he could do that. Simple thing. Anyone need to do that today? If you're here this morning and you feel like you need to recommit your life to Christ, you say, I, I'm going through some things. I just want to commit my life to Christ. I feel a, a need to recommit my life today. You want to do that? You can come right now. If you need prayer for something specific, we'll be glad to pray with you and agree with you. If you need prayer, come on. Anyone else need to come? Will we continue to pray and just further the prayers already been prayed this morning for you and for God's will for your life, for our schools for this school year? Our MDO is kicking off this week, too. We're praying for that. It's going to be a very special time. We've got wonderful staff, and it's, uh, it's full. Maybe room for a couple of more, but it's going really good. So I want you to join with us as we pray. We're going to close. If you're a visitor today, if we haven't had an opportunity to meet you, we'd love to get an opportunity to, to meet you. We'll be right over here in this other building. Just come by and say hi to us, okay? Father, we want to thank you for all you do, for your love and blessing. And, God, we thank you for your will for our lives, that perfect will that causes us to walk in the greatest fulfillment of all. We thank you, you desire in that to be our Lord, our Savior, to lead us and guide us, and we just want to give you the glory and praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen.